Well, greetings. What I want to do in the next few minutes is give you the first of two lectures on the Trinity and Christology, um, the early church debates over who God is and who Christ is and how Christ relates to the Godhead. So let's dive right in. I want to begin by talking about Christological heresies before the Council of Nicaea. Uh, because what leads up to that council is by no means the first time that we have a significant controversy uh, over Christology during the early church era. So I want to begin with Paul of Samosata. And you've read a little bit about him. Uh, he was a bishop in Antioch during the mid-third century. And Paul argued that the eternal Logos descended upon Jesus at his baptism, and that it was at that point that Jesus was adopted as God's son. For that reason, we call this view adoptionism. Now, the problem with adoptionism is that it reversed the doctrine of the Incarnation as it's stated in Scripture and as it's articulated in the rule of faith. Instead of God becoming a man, adoptionism teaches that man became a god. So for this reason, around 268 or 269, Paul was deposed as the bishop of Antioch because his teaching about the relationship between the Father and the Son was judged to be heretical by the church leaders of that time. The second sort of early Christological heretic that we want to talk about is a man named Sibelius. Uh, Sibelius was a priest, not a bishop, uh, in the city of Rome during the 3rd century, and Sibelius taught that the names Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were all used of God, but only one of those names is applicable at any given time because God existed as three successive modes or three successive manifestations throughout redemptive history. So according to Sibelius and those who would follow him, God was the Father during the Old Testament era, he became the Son when he was incarnate in Jesus Christ, and at Pentecost he became the Holy Spirit who now dwells within the church. So this position also did not seem to match up with either Scripture or the rule of faith. Uh, after all, if God existed as three successive modes in church history, uh, to whom was Christ praying during his earthly life? Even more important, what happened when Christ died? Did the Father suffer and die on the cross? Did the Spirit suffer and die on the cross? Because Father is just an earlier manifestation of the Son and Spirit's just a later manifestation of the Son. It just raises all kinds of questions. So you might think about it this way. In Sibelius's modalism, and that's what this view is going to be called, God is always Father, Son, or Holy Spirit, but He's never Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So for this reason, uh, this view was also judged to be heretical, and the Bishop of Rome excommunicated Sibelius as a heretic in the year 220. So with adoptionism and modalism, we have these early Christological heresies that really build up to the big one, and that's the Arian controversy. So we're going to spend the remainder of this time uh, talking about the Arian controversy and its aftermath. So let's start out with the initial controversy in the city of Alexandria in Egypt. While Constantine was still trying to consolidate his power and become the sole emperor of a new Roman Empire, a major controversy was brewing in the eastern half of the empire. Around 318, a priest in Alexandria named Arius initiated this controversy with his unusual views about the deity of the sun. Arius argued that the Logos was divine, but not co-eternal with the Father. So he follows Colossians 1.15, or I should say his reading of Colossians 1.15 with this. Uh, he teaches that the Logos is the firstborn of all creation, and for him that means the Logos is the, crea is the highest of all created beings. And so he's divine. But he's not divine in the same way the Father is divine, because the Father has always existed. The Logos has not always existed. So Bishop Alexander in Alexandria, I'm not making that up, Alexander of Alexandria, Bishop Alexander deposed Arius from his pulpit. 
But Arius remained really popular with the people uh, and continued to teach his views as orthodoxy. But by all appearances, he was a popular pastor, uh, a popular preacher. He was also musically talented. He would often put his teaching in the form of popular songs that anyone could learn, and that was a mnemonic device for them to remember what he was teaching. So the most famous of Arius's heretical praise choruses uh, claimed, There was a time when Christ was not. And that captures the heart of Arianism. Though the eternal Son is God, uh, he's not eternal in the same way the Father's eternal because he's created. And this is just not something that uh, the Christian fathers were willing to go with. So the controversy begins to spread. Because Arius hasn't been silenced, Alexander took the next step and he excommunicated Arius. And, and often that would have settled things. It did with those earlier heretics we discussed. But the Eastern bishops, uh, some of the Eastern bishops, criticized Alexander. They claimed that Arius's views were actually more biblical and more consistent with church tradition. So a number of smaller regional councils were held, but they went back and forth between both sides. There wasn't any sort of consensus that was reached. Some were sympathetic to Arius's views, others sided with Alexander. By the year 324, the eastern portion of the church was increasingly divided, and this was happening at the very time that the church should have been consolidating its newfound power under Constantine's protection and his blessing. Now, Constantine was obviously not a theologian, but he was troubled at how divided the church's leadership had become. If the church was going to revive the empire like Constantine was hoping, then it had to be united. So Constantine attempted to settle the dispute by writing to both Arius and Alexander and urging them to reconcile, but he claimed that Arius needed to submit to Alexander's discipline before he could be reinstated. Uh, he said that Arius couldn't be any more than a layman uh, without Constantine's permission. So even here, here we see Constantine sort of siding with the authorities, uh, even though he's trying to find a way to work around this without there being division. So that leads us to the Council of Nicaea in 325. When Constantine couldn't convince Arius and Alexander to be reconciled, he used his power as emperor to call a universal council for all Orthodox Christians to meet in Nicaea in 325. Uh, that's a city in modern-day Turkey. This was the first time any meeting had been held with imperial sanction, and it claimed to represent the entire church. So sometimes we hear the Council of Nicaea referred to as an ecumenical council, because it speaks on behalf of everyone, uh, but I think it could better be called an imperial council, uh, because even more specifically, it speaks on behalf of the empire, and it comes with the blessing of Constantine. Constantine himself attended, and initially he even presided over the council. Uh, he also paid all of the expenses of the bishops who attended, and we don't know for sure how many bishops were there. Uh, there's just conflicting paper trails, and so one of those paper trails tells us there were 220. Another tells us there were 318. Uh, but whether it was 200 and something or 300 and something, uh, the fact is Constantine paid for them all to come. And so that further blurs the line uh, between church and empire uh, in a way that we've already seen in the lecture on Constantine. So there were at least four groups represented at Nicaea. The first group were those who were committed to the same views as Arius. He wasn't the leader of that group. Uh, these are all bishops, and he's just an everyday pastor who's been deposed and excommunicated. So uh, he's not the leader of this party, but this is the party that wants to rally around his views because they agree with him. And then there was another group, the second group, on the other extreme. These are the committed anti-Arians. Uh, folks like Alexander, who are convinced that Arius' views are heretical, full stop. The third group are those who desire unity at all costs. They don't want the church to divide over this issue. And then there was a small group, a fourth group, that was genuinely undecided on these matters. I mean, you had two different groups, 
on the extremes that were both saying, uh, we believe what the Bible and the best of the Christian tradition teaches. And they had opposite answers. So there were some folks who were just honestly wrestling back and forth between these two views and trying to decide who they thought was right. So they come to Nicaea, and pretty early in the deliberations, most everybody agrees that the Arian views were heretical. They were off the reservation. The problem was in providing an alternative interpretation that everybody could agree with besides the Arians. Eventually, nearly all the bishops present affirmed the term homoousios, of one substance, as a way of describing the divinity shared by the Father and the Son. Now, the pro arius party protested. They pointed out, rightly so, that the word homoousius is not found in the Bible. But this is where the rule of faith came in, and the best of church tradition. The anti-Arian party conceded that the Bible did not use the word homoousius. But they also argued that that word best represents what the Bible and the rule of faith teaches about the deity of Christ. So you might think about it this way. The bishops decided that it was better to use extra-biblical words to express biblical doctrine than it is to use only biblical words to express heresy. That's what the Arians were doing. They were saying, well, we're only quoting the Bible. But the majority said, yeah, but you're misquoting the Bible. So they introduced this new word, homoousios, of one substance, to, uh, to summarize what the Bible and the best of the tradition teaches about the deity of Christ. So they put it in the Creed of Nicaea, and that document was adopted by all but two of the bishops who were present. Now, you would have thought that settled things, but it didn't. So that leads us to further controversy related to uh, Nicaea and its legacy. So let's talk about Athanasius, uh, this great defender of Nicene Orthodoxy, and one of my favorite early church fathers. The Council of Nicaea has condemned Arius now, but it's not a permanent victory for Orthodoxy. To make a long and complicated story as short as I possibly can, during the next 50 years, the tide would turn back and forth depending upon which party was favored by the emperor at any given time. Upon the death of Alexander in the year 328, Athanasius became the bishop of Alexandria. And like his predecessor, Athanasius was a defender of Nicene Orthodoxy. He continually wrote and preached against Arianism, and his most famous work was a treatise titled On the Incarnation of the Word. In that book... Athanasius tied the divinity of Christ to salvation. He argued that God had to become a man so that men can be restored to their pre-fall dignity and ultimately become God's lowercase g. This is the doctrine of theosis at work. Uh, we've already talked a little bit about this. Uh, you've read a little bit about this. Again, this is the idea uh, that part of salvation is being caught up into the very life of God. Uh, where there's so much discontinuity between who we are the day we begin the journey of salvation and who we are in glorification, that we've become like gods compared to what we were before. The language isn't very helpful, but I think the principle is a good principle. So Athanasius argues God, capital G, became a man so that men can become lowercase g, gods. Athanasius also argued that the Son was begotten, but not made. He had always been the Son, and the Father had always been the Father. There was never a time when the Son did not exist. So these aren't just descriptive names of two members of the Godhead. The Father has always been the Father for all eternity. And the Son has always been the Son for all eternity. So the Son isn't made like I was made, and other merely human sons are made, if you will. He was begotten, always in the process of being the Son of the Father. Athanasius also uh, affirmed a substitutionary view of the atonement, and this is important because uh, 
many modern theologians claim that that's a latter doctrine that comes about during the Middle Ages and it gets uh, refined during the Reformation, especially by the Reformed tradition, the Calvinists. Uh, but Athanasius shows us the idea that Jesus actually took the place of humans and paid the penalty for human sin. Uh, that view is found among the early church fathers, and Athanasius is probably the most famous proponent of that view. Now, he was very popular with the masses, and he was very well respected by the Orthodox party, but the anti-Nicene party did everything they could over the next 50 years to undermine Athanasius' influence. They questioned his consecration as a bishop on the grounds that he had been too young and he'd never served as a priest, and both of those charges were true. Technically speaking, Athanasius should not have been a bishop. He was the most gifted person, but he didn't meet all of the qualifications. They had him on this. They also accused Athanasius of many evil deeds. Uh, they accused him of murdering his rivals, of allegedly cutting the hand off of one of his opponents, uh, practicing black magic, sexual immorality, just sort of everything they could throw at him. Uh, and of course, they accused him of being a heretic. I mean, again, you have to understand... Both sides think they're orthodox, and the other side is heretical. Uh, so these folks think that Athanasius is the heretics, and, and that Arian-ish views are more orthodox than what Athanasius is teaching. So Athanasius was exiled on five different occasions, depending upon the whims of the particular emperor and which bishops had influence with that emperor. During these times of exile, he often hid out with the desert monks, who had been among his closest friends. Uh, in fact, he wrote the standard biography of the most famous of these monks, uh, The Life of St. Anthony. Uh, you'll read more about St. Anthony later. Athanasius died before ever seeing the matter finally resolved, but he did influence a number of other Eastern bishops to enter the fray and defend the theology of Nicaea against Arians and other heretics. So, who were those other bishops. Well, it was three or those other key theologians. Well, I want to talk briefly about three key leaders who are called the Cappadocian Fathers. Uh, that's the region of Turkey uh, where they came from. And they're all connected to each other and they're influenced by Athanasius. So the first of these Cappadocian Fathers is Basil of Caesarea. Basil came from a wealthy Christian family uh, his brother Gregory and his sister Macrina, all three of them are famous. Uh, they all take monastic vows to serve the Lord. Basil defended the deity of Christ against Arianism, so he's very much agreeing with Athanasius in that. But his bigger contribution is his defense of the deity of the Holy Spirit. Basil wrote this treatise titled On the Holy Spirit, and he argued that not only is the Son fully divine, in the same way the Father's divine, but so is the Spirit. And he says, we know the Spirit is divine based on three lines of evidence. Scripture, the rule of faith, and the church's liturgy. So you might think about it this way. Basil argues that we know the Holy Spirit is divine because the Bible teaches it, the church has always believed it, and our worship reflects this idea. Basil also argued that the Father and Son and Holy Spirit shared one substance, and that that substance was their transcendent divinity, um, their common godness, if you will, but that each had a different essence, and those essences represented their individual persons. So, one God in three persons, Basil helps the church to come to that sort of language. And so, for that reason, uh, he gets called Basil the Great. The second Cappadocian father is Gregory of Nyssa, and he's Basil's brother and the most prolific author of these three Cap Cappadocians. So, he's one of the leading advocates of what's been called the ransom view of the atonement, the idea that God tricks Satan into killing Jesus and that frees Satan's human captives and their ownership is transferred from Satan back to God. Uh, this is later going to be judged to be a deficient view of the atonement because it, number one, resorts God to trickery. He has to fool Satan. 
And number two, uh, it, it says too much in speaking of humans who are lost as being sort of the property of Satan uh, rather than being captive to Satan or blinded by Satan. Uh, but if it sounds familiar to you, maybe you're a fan of C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, in the first book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, this is the view of the atonement that Lewis portrays uh, whenever Aslan is sacrificed uh, by the White Witch and all of her minions, and the property rights of Edmund the traitor transfers uh, from the White Witch back to Aslan. Uh, C.S. Lewis was a great lover of uh, the early church and of the medieval era, and so he's drawing on this ransom view of the atonement. Gregory also influenced Eastern Orthodox hermeneutics or biblical interpretation. Uh, he prioritized spiritual Christological readings of the Old Testament, uh, what we would today call allegory, uh, far more than sort of the plain sense literal meaning of the text. Gregory also advocated uh, universal restoration, the idea that uh, the cross of Christ is so powerful that ultimately everyone will be saved. Uh, now, he's not as radical as Origen in that. He doesn't believe that even Satan and the demons are going to be saved. But Gregory does think that ultimately uh, love wins and that all people will be saved. Eastern Orthodox Christians refer to him as uh, Gregory the Great, uh, probably not as deeply appreciated among evangelicals as these other two Cappadocian fathers are uh, because of his wonky view of the atonement and his universalism. So our third Cappadocian father is Gregory of Nazianzus. Gregory of Nazianzus is Basil's best friend. Both of them had studied philosophy and theology in Athens, and one of their schoolmates had been Julian the Apostate, uh, the last of the pagan emperors of the Roman Empire. Gregory challenged the views of a heretic named Apollinaris. Now, Apollinaris is not an Arian. He thinks Jesus is fully divine. But his argument is that Jesus could not have had a human mind. That uh, if he had a human mind, it would have been corrupted by the fall. So Apollinaris claims that Jesus' human mind had been replaced by the divine Logos. And the end result of this is that Jesus of Nazareth uh, was, for all practical purposes, uh, human on the outside, but divine on the inside. Or if you want to think about it this way, um, everything about Jesus that was physical is human, but everything that is spiritual and invisible was divine. So for this reason, uh, this view has kind of jokingly been called uh, God in a bod, or spacesuit theology, that, that the invisible Son of God kind of zips up his flesh suit, and then he, he walks around, and he's almost lifelike. And that's sort of the idea you get with Apollinaris. So Gregory is horrified by this theology, and he argues that it's the human mind that most needs saving. Uh, that it's the human will, the human heart, that chooses to sin and rebel against God. Uh, it's not like our hands and our eyes are out there doing sinful things apart from who we are on the inside. And so Gregory is saying it's, it's all of us that needs to be redeemed, and really the spiritual and invisible part of us more than the physical part of us. So Gregory argues that Jesus had to be a human in every sense of the term. All that it means for us to be human, body and soul, had to be true of Jesus. And he has this great line, what the Son has not assumed has not been redeemed. If there's anything about humanity that Jesus has not taken upon himself, then that part of humanity hasn't been redeemed. So for Gregory, the idea that the Word became flesh does not mean that the Son of God wrapped himself in human flesh. What it means is that the, the Son took upon himself, assumed all that it means to be human, so that we can say Jesus is a man just like we are. And everything that it means for us to be human was also true of Jesus of Nazareth. So Gregory becomes the Bishop of Constantinople in 381, 
And the second imperial council meets there while he's bishop to revisit the Nicene Creed and to challenge Apollinaris' views. Uh, so Gregory, by the way, is Gregory the theologian. So we have Gregory the Great, Basil the Great, and Gregory the theologian. So I want to close out briefly by talking about Constantinople. So the Council of Nicaea uh, had met in 325. Now here we are a generation later, 381 in Constantinople, under the leadership of Gregory of Nazianzus. The church reaffirms what Nicaea decided. They readopt and even expand the Nicene Creed so that they're not only rejecting Arianism again, and this is kind of the final nail in the coffin for Arianism, but they also declare Apollinarianism to be heretical. This idea that Apollinaris had that, uh, that Jesus' human mind was replaced by the divine Logos. So in order to reflect the fact that both of these views were heresies, and to reiterate in greater detail that the Holy Spirit is fully divine, uh, the Creed of Nicaea is expanded and republished at Constantinople. And the, the document that comes out of it is what we now call the Nicene Creed. So if you've ever been in a church where the Nicene Creed was recited as part of public worship, it's actually the second edition from Constantinople that you were reciting uh, because it makes clear that Jesus has always existed and all that it means to be human is true of Jesus like it's true of us and the Holy Spirit is also fully divine in the same way the Son and the Father are fully divine. So the Nicene Creed becomes the definitive imperial summary of the doctrine of the Trinity. And to this day, most Christians in most places uh, affirm the Nicene Creed, uh, either as a statement of truth, full stop, or as the very best human statement that we could come up with outside of Scripture. So we'll come back in the next lecture and we'll look at stage two of these debates over Trinity and Christology.